<laughs> well, was that the flying card game? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, the guy in the right seat was writing a, home, a letter home to mother while the guy in the left yeah. seat was watching TV. No, yeah, right. Okay. That, that's a, you're talking about the EA6. They had four people that had bridge. Them. Yeah, right, you know, right, right. Bridge. Okay. <laughs> All right, thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, it's always, uh, you never know how many people you're going to get, right? So it's always very interesting for me to have uh, an audience that is uh, similar to my own age, because they uh, pretty much uh, they they okay thanks uh, they they listen and they pay attention, <laughs> and so I appreciate. Until they fall asleep. Yeah. So so this is the, this presentation is about the ski troops, and uh, I was I, I'm frequently asked um, how is a marine. Uh, telling a story about an army unit, okay? I uh, grew up in Colorado. This young lady here knew me from about 1963 on, and I started skiing in 1963. Uh, right the same year that Kennedy was killed, uh, I was learning to ski. And the first place we went was uh, uh, Berthoud, Berthoud Pass, had a ski area at that time. So I grew up skiing in Colorado, went to all of the normal places that kids, that they took us in the bus to go, to go skiing. So skiing really became my passion pretty early in my life. Um, and then, but I never knew about the 10th Mountain Division. I never went to Camp Hale. I never went to Leadville to see anything or knew anything about, about the ski troops, the guys that actually joined the Army in the war. To, uh, to go and fight the war on skis. So that, be, that because I was a skier, that, you know, I was very interested in that. And then when I went into the Marine Corps, um, the first 10 years of my 30 years in the Marine Corps, I, I spent during, in cold weather, in mountains. I was a mountain guy and kind of an expert guy. Five times in Norway, always in the winter. Um, <clears throat> because one reason was because I could ski and I had an affinity for it. And the other reason, and then I <clears throat> was assigned to a place called the Mountain Warfare Training Center in Bridgeport, California. And so the, the, the Marine Corps Mountain Warfare Training Center, we taught exactly the same things that the guys in the 10th Mountain Division were being taught at Camp Hale. <clears throat> so that, when I found out about that, and I, when I was in the Marine Corps, I still, <clears throat> still had not found out about the 10th Mountain Division. But I knew that I was doing exactly the same thing. Once I did start to find out about the 10th Mountain Division, I, I started to learn about it. So how did I find out about the 10th Mountain Division? I, my last assignment in, in the Marine Corps was at, uh, at Northcom, NORAD Northcom. So it's in Colorado Springs. So when I came home, uh, my parents were both still alive. My sister and brothers still lived in Colorado. And uh, <clears throat> I decided that I wanted to be on the ski patrol. So I started learning to be on the ski patrol. And uh, they, they give the lessons or the f familiarization in Colorado Springs, and that's where I lived. So, but they, they, are head, they, they do the volunteer ski patrol action at Ski Cooper. Now, Ski Cooper is where the training area was for the 10th Mountain Division. So as I went up to, the, to Ski Cooper, I started to see the books, and I saw the posters and things like that. And I said, these guys are pretty unique. I want to find out about them. So I started reading everything I could read about the, the, about the 10th Mountain Division. So I became more and more interested in it. And uh, that's, that's what dr drove me to it. Then I met a couple of guys. Um, so, so the presentation is about the 10th, the 10th Mountain Division. But it didn't start off that way. And it started off with uh, these guys. Let me see if I get OK, good. Here's what we're going to do. Um, these were two 10th Mountain guys. The guy in the green shirt is named Sandy Treat. And he lived in Vail for the rest of his, the, the back part of his life. And the other guy is Dick Over. Um, <clears throat> Sandy died in 2008, or 18, and Dick is now in an Alzheimer home up in Loveland. 
And this picture was taken there at the Ski Trooper statue in, uh, in Vail. So the skiing in America really starts uh, in about, it started to get a big in, in 1932 at the Lake Placid Olympics. And uh, there was a, an announcer called Lowell Thomas. And Lowell Thomas was a guy that uh, loved to ski, and he, he was quite a skier himself. He, he spent time and was from Victor, Colorado. And so as Lowell Thomas talked about skiing in America, it really started to come up. And uh, then in, in the 30s, the, the depression was just getting over with. And so the young and beautiful would uh, take off and they'd leave New York and Boston and, and Hartford and they'd go up to, to uh, Vermont and uh, uh, New Hampshire to go skiing. And in those days, it was mainly walking up the hill and sliding down. And then farmers would rent their farmland so that people could ski. Then they got this idea, well, we'll use the tractor, we'll hook up a rope tow, and we'll start hooking people up so they can pull themselves up. So that became more and more popular. So as skiing took off then, it got to be more and more popular. And then as on the West Coast, there was people took up skiing also. So as soon as the 30s are starting to move along now, um, you see the starlets of the day, they start to, to, to go skiing too. And, they, and there was a place called, there was, you know, uh, Sugar Bowl was the one that I became most familiar with out in California. It's, uh, it's, it's near Squaw Valley, um, and that the old, old ski area is out there, and that's where these guys went. And, uh, Gary Cooper and Claudette Colbert were real big shots at, at Aspen. So um, this fella, Walt Disney, comes along in 1939, and he buys up part of uh, the mountain at, uh, for, at Sugar Bowl. And this, this Austrian fella in the middle here, his name is Hanni Schroll. And Hanni Schroll uh, was an Austrian champion and a ski instructor. And he, he, had, he had one of the two ski schools at Sugar Bowl. Well, Hanni Schroll loved the yodel. And so if you've ever seen the Walt Disney picture of Goofy learning to ski, you'll hear, uh, you'll hear Goofy yodeling, and that's Hanni Schroll. And that's, that's the guy. So what else happens in 1933? Well, Adolf Hitler becomes the Chancellor of Germany in 1933. So when he becomes Chancellor of Germany, his uh, ambitions for expansion of Germany and <clears throat> begin. And so in 1936, the first thing he does is he re-enters the Rhineland. The Rhineland is a 30-mile strip of land adjacent to Germany on the German side of the Rhine River. And so as he does that, that's contrary to what was agreed to in the Treaty of Versailles. And, but the, the, he wasn't supposed to do that, but when he did that, he moved, his army went in there and they mobilized. And the Allies, uh, Britain, France, and the United States, didn't do anything about it. So that was Hitler's first big gamble. Then in 1938, on March the 12th, uh, Hitler moves into Austria. That was called the Anschluss. And so he takes over Austria. And it, basically, with the willful concurrence of the Austrian people, um, and then he, he begins to think more and more about uh, what am I gonna what am I gonna do next? And so he says he's looking at Czechoslovakia, and he says, well, Czechoslovakia, there's a lot of Germans in Czechoslovakia, and I need that too for the expansion of the Reich. So when he moves into that, he takes he goes into the Sudetenland, and so. The Allies now are becoming more and more concerned about what is Hitler going to do, what is he going to do next, and so they have a, a meeting. So the next meeting goes in September 30th of 1938, and this was when the Munich Pact was signed. And this is when Prime Minister Chamberlain and Mr. Dadlier, the Prime Minister of France, uh, they get together and they meet. And, uh, he's, and Hitler tells them, I have no further territorial expansion uh, in mind. I'm good with what I've got and happy to do that. But uh, so, so just let me have the Sudetenland. So they say, all right, but that's it. And then Mr. Chamberlain goes back to England with his white piece of paper. And he says, we will have peace in our time. Um, so that was that. And then what happens uh, after that is a Hitler changes his mind, and he decides that he will invade Poland. And so when he invades Poland, that takes place on September the 1st of 1939. And when he'd done that, 
uh, England and France had made guarantees to Poland that if anything else happened with Hitler's expansion, we will declare war. So Hitler goes into Poland, and de Britain declares war on September 3rd, 1939. September 1st of 1939 is when historians place the beginning of World War II. So what Hitler does is uh, he's going to invade Poland from and, and move out of, from, out of Germany and move east, but he's also made a deal with Stalin that he would let Stalin have the eastern part of Poland if he did not, if he came in with him and did not fight against, so Hitler wouldn't have to fight against the, uh, the Brits, the France, and Germans at the same time. So on the 17th of September, the, the Soviets invade uh, Poland. So now the Soviets are emboldened by their successes in, in Poland. Um, the Soviets didn't have too much, too hard of fighting because Hitler had already done the bulk of the fighting and destroyed the Polish Air Force and things like that. So now the, 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 the Soviets are emboldened to go and move into Finland. So as they go into Finland, they move into Finland on the 30th of November of 1939. So on 1939, that very end of, in November, is when they, when they go in and then the Soviets invade uh, Finland with about a half a million men, uh, <clears throat> about 2,000 tanks and armored personnel carriers and all the rest of that. But what happens to Finland is the Finns are going to fight back. <clears throat> now the Finns are in their own territory, their own land that, ha that is snow-covered, forested land, not too mountainous, but they have plenty of snow. So the Finns are going to fight back. And as the Finns are going to fight back, um, we have a guy named L.S. David Bradley. David Bradley was a champion uh, cross-country skier. And David Bradley was a news correspondent. And he had write letters and write articles for newspapers in the Midwest and magazines. And so he reports back to Washington, D.C., and to the newspapers about how well the Finns are doing. And the Finns are killing a lot of the, of the Germans there. So um, what happened to the Soviets is when they came across with all those vehicles, when you have all those vehicles, you have to stay on roads. <clears throat> and what the, the Finns developed was what they called was Mahdi tactics. They, on, a, on a road like this in the forest, they would drop a, a tree across the road at one end. Then the, the column would have to stop. They'd drop another trees at the other end of the column. Then the column was stopped in the middle. And if, they, if the Soviets got out of those vehicles, the Finns lit them up. And so they were killing them at the cyclic rate. And then in the, the Russians were freezing. And so they'd get out of their tanks and stuff in the, in night, build a bonfire. And again, then the Finns would kill them. And so they just lit them up on the side of the road. And the Finns were, were using their skis and their reindeers to pull their gear. And they had machine guns. They had rifles and things like that. And then the Soviets were freezing because the people that they, the Soviets brought to, to Finland didn't have all of the warm gear that they needed. So as a result of that, the two full Soviet divisions were annihilated. And I mean annihilated, not decimated, annihilated. And one KVD regiment was, was annihilated at that time also. So the Finns were wondering, what are we going to do with all these bodies? How are we going to get rid of all of that? That was one of the problems that the Finns were facing. But they were only facing that problem as long as the winter lasts. So um, in February of 1940, there was four guys that they meet at this inn, Johnny Seesaw's Inn, at the foot of Bromley Mountain. Um, it, it's right outside of Manchester. Bromley was one of the ski areas in New Hampshire. It was Roger Langley, Minnie Dole, Alec Bright, and Robert Livermore. Bright and Livermore had been on the 1936 Olympic team, ski team. Um, Roger Langley was head of the National Ski Association, and Minnie Dole was the head of the National Ski Patrol. So these two, four guys, they ski all day, they come in here, they sit down in here. Now this lodge isn't there anymore, that's the old lodge. There's a new lodge, it's all been refurbished, but it's still called Johnny Seesaws, and they kept the original fireplace. So now 
as they meet in there, Minnie Dole says, and they have a discussion, they said, what if Hitler came across the ocean, invaded Canada, and if they took Canada, and they could come right down the Champlain Valley and invade New York? And what the problem is, gents, is we have no capability to stop such an incursion. Our soldiers, our army, does not know how to fight in the snow and in the cold. And we need to go to the army and tell them we can help, but we need to develop this capability. So they decide then that they're going to undertake a letter writing campaign to uh, see what they can do to convince the army to develop a capability to fight in the winter and in cold weather. Now the next thing that happens is, in, now that meeting was in February, now it's April. Now the Germans invade Norway. And then they take over Norway. So again, we're, we've got a war going on in the mountains and in the snow and in cold weather. So the Brits decide that they're going to send a brigade of soldiers to Norway to help evict the Germans. So there, there's a big fight that the British Navy was doing pretty well, but the, the army, the Norwegian, and what the brigade consisted of Brits, Norwegians, and Poles. But they were ignominiously defeated. The Brits had to be evacuated out of Norway. And there was another, and then, so that was another black eye for guys who didn't know how to fight in the snow. So then in May, May the 10th, Germany invades Holland, France, uh, uh, Luxembourg, Belgium. And they walk right through France. In less than 30 days, France has taken over. And then because of the successes that, that, Mr. that Hitler is having, uh, his partner in crime, Mussolini, decides there is going to be a reorganization in Europe and I want to be part of it. So he decides that he's going to fight his old enemy, the Greeks. So, but to get from the Greece, from Italy, you got to go through the Balkans. So what happens with Mussolini launches his army to, to go through the Balkans to, to fight the Greeks. And he tells Hitler, Mein Führer, we are on the march. Well, what happens is the, the early winter comes, and uh, there's, it's a disaster. Uh, he's, there's 10,000 casualties. And it's because the Italians don't know how to fight in the snow either. And so there's all these cold weather casualties they are ignominiously defeated. Hitler has to go and rescue the, the Italians, and he's furious about it. Well, what's happening in the United States is we have an Army officer, Lieutenant Colonel L.S. Giroux, who is a, who is a plans officer. He was, in, he was in war plans, and he was writing back letters back to his bosses, General McNair and General Marshall, about this fight that's going on. And he's the one that's telling them about these 10,000 cold weather casualties. And so these guys are beginning to think, you know, maybe, maybe it's going to be necessary for us to develop a, a cold weather capability so we can, if we're going to get into this war, and it looks like we are, then we gotta, we got to start to think about doing something about it. Now, as far as the Germans were concerned, in 1940, they had three uh, mountain divisions. We had none. Um, and these guys were good. All right, They knew what they were doing. A lot of those Germans in the mountain divisions were from Bavaria and from Austria. And so when you go up against these, these soldiers, these are some of the finest soldiers in the German army. And so what we have then is many dole is working as hard as he can to try to convince General Marshall and General McNair that we need to have a cold weather capability so that we can fight in the mountains and in the snow. Oh, there he is. I'm sorry. Um, that's Minnie Dole there, and he's going he's gonna to be the guy that's going to lead the charge to get this cold weather business going. Now, General Marshall and the president are also getting letters from Minnie Dole and he's telling them, we've got to do something about this. And what, they, what Minnie Dole tells them is that if you all will let us, I will use the National Ski Patrol 
and the National Ski Patrol will train soldiers in, the, in capability on skis, on snowshoes, in the snow. So, he, so they, General Marshall and General McNair decide, all right, we'll get volunteers this winter to see how many volunteers would want to participate in cold weather training. So they, the message goes out, we can take six divisions and we'll train them at five different places. So there was two places on the East Coast, two places in the Midwest, and, two places, and one place on the West Coast. So they went to Old Fords, New York, and Plattsburgh Barracks. They went to Fort, uh, Fort Schnelling, Minnesota, and uh, Camp McCoy, Wisconsin. And the, the guys on the West Coast went to Fort Lewis. So they were going to be trained by these guys, or they were going to undergo training. But then the Army had some guys in it already that could train people. So. Um, as the training goes through and it comes out so it's pretty successful, at the end of that first year, now this is January, February, and March of 1941. The United States is not into the war yet, but it looks like the war clouds are gathering. It looks like we're going to get there. So then the message comes out, all right, this was pretty successful. We should probably stand up a battalion or so. So on the 15th of November, of 1941 is when the first unit of the 10th Mountain Division was formed. And that was the first battalion of the 87th Mountain Infantry that was established on that day, 15 November 1941. So then 22 days later, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. So, um, sorry, I gotta do two things at once. So when the war comes, then the, the, the nation is going to have to react to that. So America prepares to go to war, and uh, the, the lines to, of young men to enlist starts to form, and the army goes to uh, Minnie Dole, and he says to them, I need 3,000 guys in 60 days. So 3,000 guys is about a regiment, okay? So now he's got a he, we've got the message that says we've, we're going to stand up the 1st Battalion, get me the rest of the guys. Minnie Dole says, okay, I will get you, I will do the recruiting for, the, for this mountain organization, for this mountain infantry, if that's what you want. But I'm going to do it my way. What I'm going to do is I'm going to have guys, and I will vet them, and I will put out an application. So anybody that wants to get into the mountain infantry will have to fill out an application form. That in application form will be mailed back to me. Accompanying that application form will be three letters of recommendation. Now, you never had to fill out an application to get into the infantry. You never had to fill out, <laughs> you never had to get three letters of recommendation to get into the infantry. But Minnie Dole says, if you went into the mountain infantry, if you went into the ski troops, you got to go through me. And so he says, I will do it. And so uh, what happened was that after Minnie Dole got the application and he looked it over and he looked over the uh, three letters of recommendation, he would vet it. Then he would send a card to the kid. The kid would go down and he would report to his induction center. They would give him his shots, give him a uniform, and he'd be there about a week, and then he'd put him on a train and he'd send him out to Fort Lewis. Because Fort Lewis is where it's all going to start at, okay? But now, who are these people? All right, this beautiful young guy up here on top is John Jay. He is a direct descendant of the first Supreme Court Justice. Now, what John Jay was was a filmmaker, but he was a brilliant guy. He, was a, he had a, a Rhodes Scholarship, but he turned it down so he could go be the coach of the Chilean ski team. He loved to make, he made ski movies, and he made two, made, the two movies he made before he got into the Army was called Ski Here, Senor, and Ski the Americas North and South. So he's, he's a pretty wealthy guy. He went to Williams College in Western Massachusetts, and he's really smart. So he's got these ski movies, and he's got a friend, and her name is Debbie Bankart. And that's her. Um, and he felt that she had to contribute to the war effort uh, because she couldn't enlist in the, on the service. 
So what she does is she takes John Jay's movies and goes around the country throughout the snow belt, and particularly all the schools that have a ski team. And she shows these movies and she narrates them. And later they make a, a movie called Ski Patrol, and that is a big recruiting tool for her as well. But she's the one now that's going to go around the country and the Army's going to pay for her to get on the train and go around the country and show ski movies and do the recruiting. So as she's going around, she's handing out the application. You think you're good enough? You want to get into the ski troops? You think you can make it? And so they take that application, the boys fill it out, get their three letters of recommendation, and they have to send it in to her. And then Minnie Dole, of course, he's doing everything he can. He's advertising in magazines. He's making posters. He's, ma <laughs> he's, doing, everything. he's doing everything he can to, to, to do this. And, um, so as the, as the first guys form up, they're all, they're all sent out of Fort Lewis. Now, Fort Lewis is, is, is flat. Uh, Mount Rainier is 65 miles away. So the troops are coming in to Fort Lewis, and uh, they, they've got their letters, or, uh, they've been approved. So now they've got their uniforms, and they've got, they're in the Army. But they don't, they don't know the basic things about being in the Army. They don't know how to salute. They don't know what colors are. They don't know what retreat is. They don't know anything. They don't know anything about marching. They've got to learn all of that out there at Fort Lewis. Plus, they've got to learn how to be ski troopers. So what the Army does then is they rent two ski lodges, the Paradise Lodge and the Tatouche Lodge up at Mount Rainier. And this is the par Oh, God darn it, Tommy. <laughs> this, is, this is the Paradise Lodge there at the back. This is the 1st Battalion of the 87th. So now the 87th is start to fill up with the troopers, and, uh, and, they're, and they're starting their training. So as their training is going along, um, and they've got the, a certain cadre of guys, certain cadre of guys from the Army that were, that were assigned now and that wanted to be there. Two, two of the guys had been ski team captains, one at Washington and one at Oregon, and they, they were part of this outfit too, um, Paul Lafferty and, uh, and, uh, and Woodward. Um, I'll get his name in a minute. But when they get out there to Fort Lewis and they're, they're training up at Mount Rainier, they have to learn, look, we're not just doing downhill skiing anymore. That's play skiing. You're going to put a pack on your back, put a rifle on your back. You're going to ski cross country. You're going to camp outside. You're going to put up a tent. You're going to make an expedient shelter so that you can, you can learn to live out there. So they decide that as they're going through this that they got to do that stuff, and they're learning to do that. But they, the Army decides, well, we can't keep uh, renting ski lodges for these guys. We're going to have to build them a camp. So where are we going to go? So the, the boss's name was Onslow Rolf. He was lieutenant colonel at the time. They're going to send him, and there's two other guys, Hurtis and Walker. They were lieutenant colonels from, from headquarters army. And they go out and they start looking around for a place where we can build a camp for these guys. So they look at various places. So what, what's the criteria that we need to build a camp for? Well, number one, you're going to need plenty of snow. You're going to need rocks so they can climb on in the summer because you can't ski all year. And it's going to have to be close to a railroad. It's going to have to be close to a hard surface road. And it, it, if it was close to some town, it would be kind of nice. So, so he starts to look, they start to look around, and they find this, this whistle stop. It's called Pando. OK, Pando, well, what happened in Pando was it was an ice station from 1903 to 1938. And if you, if you go up there, they, they had a pond, and they would cut ice out in the winter, and then they'd put it on the trains because they grew a lot of produce over there. And the, the produce had to be kept cold, so that's what the ice station was. So when the Army comes along and they find this valley, and they find it, hey, we, well, we got, a, we got a whistle stop here that's part of the DN, uh, DNRG, the Denver Rio Grande Railroad. And so that's where we're going to put it. We're going we're gonna to put this camp here, Camp Hale. And I think everybody in here is from Colorado, right? This, this yellow line is I-70. Um, 
Copper Mountain ski areas. Oh, I can use this. I can use this for this. <laughs> so you, you, get, you get off of, 90, off of I-70, come down 91 to Leadville, then you take 24, you get up to Camp Hill and to, to get to Pando. So that's where we're going to build. That's where we're going to build a camp. Um, so the construction begins in April of 1942. It's going to go through November of, of 1942. So at the, they bring in all these construction crews. They have to bring in tons and tons of dirt to build up because it's virtually a wetlands is all, is all it is. And it's going to be named after this guy, a Colorado boy. He graduated from East High School, 19, 1877, went to West Point. There you go. There's your, there's your partner. Um, you know him, right? <laughs> so he's one of the founders of the VFW. Uh, and he was with uh, Teddy Roosevelt in Malaya. So as, they, as they're going to do it, gosh, did I show you, did I show you him? I am, I'm sorry. That's him. That's General Hill. They have to, they have to dredge the Eagle River. It has to get straightened out, which it does. Um, they build over 800 buildings up there between April and November. And they, they build it at a cost of about $31 million in 1942. So it would be about the cost of a football stadium today if, if you, if you did it, want to do a cost comparison. So that's what Camp Hale looked like in its heyday. Um, this is probably taken in, in 1943. And you can see all of these, all of these barracks were, were down here. This is the road. This is, that's the north end of the camp is that way. This is the south end of the camp. And from here back, the river goes through here that I just showed you that got dredged out. These are mule barns. So because mountain troops don't always have roads, so you have to have plenty of mules. So there was like 4,000 mules that they had there at, at the, at, at the, by 1944. Now this end of the camp is, is the north end of the camp. This is where the, the women were, finally, when the, after the women got there in 43, this is where they stayed. And then there was some civilian housing back here. There was also a stockade back there and the hospital. The hospital was back here. Where's the parade ground? <laughs> well, yeah, right. Um, there was, yeah. Tennis? Tennis? I, uh, no, no, that's an Air Force base. I don't, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, I think this was pl the private, a place where they had a grenade pit and they had a, they had a, a bayonet course. I don't, do you know Flint? Yeah, this is the north half of the, the camp. The south half is where the uh, parade ground was, where the bayonet course was, the tear gas uh, training area, the rifle range, it's all to the south. Yeah, and I, I, don't, I, I don't have a big enough picture <laughs> that I can get it all in, all in there to you. So, let's see. All right, so the mules. So, with the 4,000 mules, everybody had to go to mule school, all right? <laughs> so you had to learn how to take care of the mules. You had to curry the mules, feed the mules, water the mules, muck the mules' stalls. And it didn't matter if you were the greatest skier in the world, you still had to go to mule school. So a guy like me, um, vertically challenged as I am, it's hard to get all of that gear up on the top of the mule. So you had to have fairly big guys that were you know, at least doing part of that work. Um, and now as 43 comes along, Minnie Dole has to change the requirements on the application. So he has to change it so that you don't have to be a skier to get into the tent. So he gets these kind of guys, lumberjacks, blacksmiths, forest rangers, and guys like that. So as, 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 they, as they start to build up and build out the, what, what they all had, they got different kind of stars, uh, like Jim Like was a rodeo star, uh, Paul Petzl. Now this guy was uh, the, the, known as the highest man in America. And so when he was 18, he was on the team that was going to climb K2. They didn't make it to the top. But K2 is harder to climb than Mount Everest, OK? Somebody got sick on the, on the route, and he had to come back, so he never made it to the top. This is a guy that started the outdoor, National Outdoor Leadership School. Um, then you got the, the foreigners. The, this guy is Swiss, 
uh, Peter Gabriel. He was a ski instructor and mountain guide, and he had guided all over the world. And then you have Walter Prager. Walter Prager was from Davos, Switzerland. He was known at the time as the greatest skier in the world. He had won the Kandahar twice, 1931 and 1933, which was the World Cup of the day. And then he left Switzerland, came to America, and he was the coach of the Dartmouth ski team. And the Dartmouth ski team was the ski team in America. I mean, they won the national championship like eight years in a row while Walter Prager was there. Um, he was there, and then, then a bunch of the other Austrians were also coming. Uh, Tony Matt, Lugi Fugger. Uh, Tony Matt was an Austrian ski champion. Lugi Fugger was a big instructor. Uh, all of these Austrians that came, they, they were all part of the Hanni Schneider Ski School. Um, and then you had these guys who went on pretty big deal in, in America. Friedel Pfeiffer, this is the guy that started Aspen. He was younger than Walter Prager, and he was probably as good a skier as Prager, but he just, because he had to get out of Austria because of the Anschluss, he didn't get to ski in all of those events, all those European events. But, but he, was, he was the best. And I, I met a guy one time um, up at Vail named Pepe Gromshammer. And Pepe Gromshammer owns Gromshammer Chalet there. And he, and he said, Friedel was the best, and I knew them all. <laughs> Here's John Jay again later in life, and he continues to make in ski movies. Steve Knowlton was a ski Olympian, uh, and he went on and he, he came up with Ski Country USA. Uh, there's Larry Jump and his wife. Larry's the guy that started A Basin. He can, when he came back, he was the founder of A Basin. And here's young Pete Seibert. Uh, there he is, bef after the, that's before he got hurt in the war. Um, he's the founder of Vail. Um, let's see, who else we got? Come on, baby. Okay. Now here's the, here, Toger Torkel is the holder of the world, he's the world champion ski jumper. 289 feet when he got killed and he was the holder of the, of the, of the world record. Um, here he is, and it was said about Toger Torkel that he could put a pack on his back and leap up on the table and land flat-footed with a, with a, from, like, jump from here, jumping up on there. It would be, he, because his legs had such a spring in them. Um, all right, so 1943 comes along, and what this line is, is the farthest expanse of the greater East Asian co-prosperity sphere of the, of the Japanese. So within that sphere are the islands of Attu and Kiska. So in 1943, the army sends out a, a brigade out to Attu. They fight the Japanese on the island of Attu. About 350 soldiers were killed out on Attu. The Japanese uh, tried a, a bonsai charge. They did do a bonsai charge, and they were all killed. Okay, so that was what happened in Attu, but the Japanese also had Kiska. So the, these two islands, now bear in mind, Alaska at this time is a territory, but this is American territory, and we cannot tolerate having the Japanese occupying our territory. So the army decided we've got to take them out both. We're going to go there, and we're going to, you're going to beat them. Um, so we decided then that they were going to, launch an operation out there, uh, Operation Cottage, it was called in, in 1943. There was 34,000 troops that were going to be part of it. Um, and that's the size of the invasion force that went out to, to Kiska. Pretty good size. And, and the idea was that the, they would land. Now, back up. Who, who are we going to send out to Kiska? We already had the experience of Attu. So why don't we use these cold weather guys that are sitting around Camp Hale? So we're going to use the 87th. We're going to use the 87th Mountain Infantry. We're going to get them, and we're going to make them part of this task force. So the 87th, and when they're going to get off the ship before dawn, climb to the top of this mountain, hold on to the top of the mountain off the Japs, then the infantry will land behind them, and they'll climb up the mountain, and, and we'll take the island of Kiska. So what happens is it's very, very foggy. 
And if you've ever been out to the Aleutians, it's foggy all the time. And it's very, very windy out there all the time. And the wind is kind of, the, and the rain come, and it's misty like all the time. So when these guys get off, they go up, they climb up the top of the mountain, they get up the top of the mountain, and the mountain is shaped like a, a U, like that. And then there's some soldiers on this side, and there's some soldiers on this side, and it's foggy at night, and it's all you hear on the radios, and you hear the screaming, help, we're surrounded, we need help down here, and then boom, 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 butta, 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 off goes the machine guns, and there's more screaming on the radios, to get more guys down here to the headquarters. We need help, we need help. Finally, the officers get control, cease fire, cease fire. What, what is going on? Give me your casualty counts. Give me your sit reps. Give me your situation reports. So they come in, I've got a guy down, I've got a guy wounded, I've got a, where's the Japanese? How many Japanese bodies are out there? Sir, we can't find any. So keep looking, find what happened. Because all I know is I've got guys that have died. And there's guys, and there's stories about, about these guys and how they died and that they were killed. And what did they find when they started looking around? They couldn't find any Japanese. They actually found one Japanese dead, and he had died of a disease prior to the Japanese evacuating the island. The Japanese had evacuated the island in June and July. <clears throat> These guys landed in August. They, they are, the Navy swore that they were there. The Navy swore that the, that the Japanese could not have made it through their, their barrier uh, of ships, but they did. The Japanese had evacuated the island. Um, what had happened then, there was 23 guys that were killed in action, 55 wounded, all from the 87th and all were, done, were killed by friendly fire or, uh, or uh, booby traps. So the 87th is out there on Kiska for the next six months. So they don't get to start coming home until about December. And the reason that they couldn't get home is because all of those ships that I just showed you, those guys were all reassigned. They're going down to the South Pacific somewhere else, and they've got other things to do. So there's no shipping to get these guys off of Kiska to bring them home. During World War II, particularly in the Pacific, shipping was the, the major cause of concern throughout the war. So whether it was in the South Pacific or whether it was in Europe or in the Mediterranean, it was always the same. Now, I put this slide in because I wanted to show you it took three engines to pull that train up to Camp Hale and the Leadville. And as it, you can see, that those are coal burning engines, and that's coal dust going into the air uh, all around. And so in order, Camp Hale, it's gonna have 12,000 guys out there by the end of 43, beginning of 44, 12,000 guys. You gotta resupply those guys, because you gotta bring up food, you gotta bring up gasoline for the cars, you gotta bring up everything, because it's, Camp Hale is like Fort Apache. It's out there in the middle of nowhere. So in order to, to, to resupply those guys, you're gonna to have to use that train. And you can see the dust in the air here uh, over the top of Camp Hale. That's the coal dust. And what would happen to these guys is they would get this bronchial uh, inflammation and they would hack it up and they'd be coughing all the time. And it was called, what they called it was Pando Hack. And there were some guys that couldn't take it, and they had to be transferred out. But for the most part, most of the guys, most of the guys could take it. Um, but you, you learn to, to get along. And, and the other thing is it's very dry, because Camp Hale is 9,240 feet in elevation. So it's very dry out there all the time. Well, in the summertime, it didn't matter so much, because you didn't have to have all that coal, uh, for, because all of those barracks were also heated by coal. So in the summertime, they did rock climbing, rough terrain, rough terrain travel. They did, uh, and they'd go out and they'd bivouac. So this is a bivouac out at one of the rock areas. So then you'd bivouac out there, sleep overnight in your pup tent, and then you'd, you'd do your training. There was a few guys that went back to 
Fort Lewis and to, to do a glacier training. And uh, that, that's a small detachment. It was only like 10 guys that went out there. And they were doing glacier training because they, nobody knew where they were going. They didn't know if they were going to Russia. They didn't know if they were going to Norway. They didn't, go, they, they didn't know if they were going to China. They didn't know where they were going. So they had to train for everything. But by and large, the training was all about skiing. Now, about at the end, half of the division of the 15,000 guys, about half of them were recruited by Minnie Dole. And so of those that Minnie Dole recruited, you know, most of them were skiers, but then you had a lot of the lumberjacks and other guys like that. So everybody had to go through ski training by the numbers. And so as they trained, um, that's what it looked like. And this is there at Camp Hale, uh, where it's pretty flat. That may be the parade ground. I don't know. <laughs> but it will look like this. So here's the, you can see that the, the, the uh, you, you, can, you can tell the, the instructor, he's got the white band on his arm there. And all the rest of these guys are going down uh, just as they would, just as, as any normal training day uh, out in the field. And when you're, when you're a mountain trooper or, or you're assigned in the mountains, training doesn't stop because of the weather. You it's immaterial. Um, you're going to get out, get on the road, and you're going to get out there and do it. And so here's another example. These guys are out there hump, humping up the hill, and they're all carrying packs. They're all carrying rifles. They're all learning how to do it. And if you couldn't ski before, you're going to learn to ski while you're in the ski troops. So, so that was a good thing. And then, of course, you have the mules, and you got to do those. <laughs> And here's a young trooper with a, with a mortar on his back or a piece of a howitzer that, that goes, because many of the, howitzer, of the mules were assigned to the artillery battalions. So we ended up with three artillery battalions out there. Um, and so you need a lot of mules. It took six mules to move one gun, to move one uh, pack, pack 38 howitzer. So here's a fully loaded mule. Um, and that's what they look like. And there's a mule skinner with them. Uh, but, but then we got the weasels. So the, the weasels was a, uh, was a snow machine that Mr. Churchill wanted. And so we, Studebaker Company built these weasels. We came up with three variants, uh, the T-15, the T-28, and T-29. And you can see these fellows here uh, ski oaring behind it. Uh, when you're ski oriented and you're going uphill, it's much easier. Then, and it's kind of easy when you're flat. It's much more difficult when you're going downhill because you outrun the, the machine. So, so uh, when, you're, when you're going and you don't have a weasel and you don't have mules, then you're reduced to Armstrong power. And so you can see the wind is whipping up here, and you can see these guys pulling that toboggan. And they're still wearing their packs, uh, carrying it. So when you conduct training like this, your young guys are going to be in really, really good shape. Um, now, if you get a, if a, a mule, he really doesn't want to go if the snow is up to his elbows. And if it touches his belly, he won't go at all. And so you have to unload the mule. You have to put all the gear that the mule had on the back of a soldier. You have to move it around so you can pack the mule again. So. That's, that was life. And in 43, about 200 women were assigned out there to Camp Hill. So when the guys are coming back from Kiska, they see all the women there now, so morale really picked up a lot. Uh, <laughs> after, so the women were doing various jobs. They were drivers and mechanics and clerical, and they ran a PX and all different kinds of things. Minnie Dole is still, uh, Minnie Dole is still Advertising. Milne Dole still got his contract with the Army. This is Walter Prager um, on the cover of Life magazine. Oh, and then the movies came out there. And so when Warner Brothers comes out, they're going to make a movie called Mountain Fighters. And so Mountain Fighters is a 21 minute color propaganda movie. And it's great. <laughs> but it's pure propaganda. And it's, but, it, but it, you show them this young guy, and he's, he's a real. He's a, Norwe he's, a, 
it's taken after Torger Tokol, I think. He's a Norwegian, he's got the accent and all the rest of that stuff. But that was a huge benefit to recruiting um, when they made it. The rifle range still goes on, whether it's uh, snowing or not, or raining or sleet or whatever. And then, so then, what do you do on the weekends? What are these guys, what's on? Well, what's, the, what's on these guys' minds? And, and so the, the, there's the, that, that's the, that, Betty Grable and Rita Hayworth, the two, the two most popular pinups in the whole war. So that's what they think about. Where do you go? So you go down to Leadville if, if you can. And so you get paid, and then you could go to Leadville if you, if you could get a pass. And this place is still there. And we go there every year, and we, every time we have a meeting up there, we all go inside there. So when you go inside the, the Silver Dollar, right to the left, you'll see a picture on the wall, and you'll see a bunch of soldiers in there from the 10th Mountain with the 10th Mountain patch on them. Now, as a, as a historic aside, this was the place where Doc Holliday killed his last man, was in that, was in that, was in that bar. Now, because Leadville... Uh, had uh, prostitutes, and it had minors. And so the soldiers would go there, and they'd get in fights, and if they engaged the, uh, the services of a prostitute, you could get some type of venereal disease. And so that's willful destruction of government property. <laughs> and so, it's, so then if you can't work, then you're in trouble. So Leadville was off limits frequently, but not all the time. Now this it was another place that the guys loved to go. They loved to go to Aspen for the skiing. And so the guy that ran the Jerome Hotel, his name was Elsha, and um, Mike Elsha, and he would give the, give the soldiers a, a, a night, a, a room aboard, a room, and then he could get breakfast and a, and a meal the night before, and it was all for like three bucks. And so these guys could really love it. Now. Here's the story on this photograph. The guy that owns the car, he's the guy taking the picture. And the, the other five guys, um, they're all signalmen. They're, and so this guy here, I was skiing in Arapaho Basin one day, and I had my helmet on, and on the front of my helmet is my 10th Mountain sticker. And this guy says to me, are you in the 10th Mountain? Nope, not in the 10th Mountain. I just know a lot about it. And he says, you know that picture of the, of the guy standing in front of the Jerome? You know that guy holding the beer? Yeah, I know that picture, and I know that guy, who that guy is. He says, that's my dad. <laughs> so I, I, I love that. So uh, the other place that these guys love to go is down to Denver, to, to, the, to the Brown Palace. And Steve Knowlton said that this was the unofficial headquarters for the 10th when they came down on the weekend. So uh, Steve Knowlton gets back from Kiska. Sir. Down the I'm getting to that, sir. Oh, Let me tell a story. <laughs> so, so what Steve did, him and two guys, uh, they had their ropes and they tied them off at the top. This is New Year's Eve. And so at the stroke of midnight, they throw the ropes over. Those three guys, they, they repel down. Um, and Steve says, we were met by the unwelcoming committee. And then we, we told them we wouldn't do it again. <laughs> So, so that was another story, of a tenth story that these guys love to do. So uh, now you get up to uh, the end of 1943, into 1944, you have what, the, it was, what was going to be, they were going to be tested, and it was called the Division Series Test. And every division before it got deployed overseas had to be evaluated to see that their officers could shoot, move, and communicate, and that the troops could live, and they could function, and they could, a machine gunner could hit what he was hitting, aiming at, and everything else. That was called the D-series. That still happens today. Before you deploy, you got to get tested, you got to get evaluated to make sure that you can do all, everything you're supposed to do. So the, the D-series happens, and here's one of the guns out in the snow. Um, we can only assume that these guys have a mule that helped them bring that gun into place, that uh, Pac-75 howitzer, and uh, so they were. All, everybody's going through, and that's what they're doing. Now, the the, the D series ends in uh, April, and now, now 
the springtime has become is coming to Camp Hale, and so, so these guys are going to wonder. So what's going to happen to us? We don't know. But then June happens, and D-Day happens. So now we're really wondering uh, what's going to happen to us. So they get their orders June 22nd. They're going to go and depart to Camp Swift, Texas. So these guys are thinking, they're scratching their head. They're, they're loading up on the train up at Camp Hale. Um, and they're scratching their head thinking, why are we going to Texas? And these guys are, you know, I got my three letters. I didn't join the Army to, to go to Texas and <coughs> train like that. Well, well, look, you're in the Army. You're going where we tell you. And so they go down. They get down to Camp Swift. So they're going to they're gonna be down at Camp Swift for about six months. At Camp Swift, they're going to get about a little over 2,000 more guys. 2,400 more guys is going to join. So you're, the, the numbers are going to increase from 14,000 to a little over 15,000. Okay? Thereabouts. So that's what you're going to take. But they're going to get heavy weapons and they're going to get heavy mortars. They're going to get more guys. Like I said, 2,000 more guys. And so the training begins. So down at Camp Swift, then they get this guy. And this guy was the gunfighter. And he was a Medal of Honor recipient from World War I. So George P. Hayes, he takes over the division on Thanksgiving Day of 1944. And he's the guy that's going to take them to, uh, to Italy. And so then shortly thereafter, in the beginning of December, the 86th gets their, their orders. And so the orders are to move from Camp Swift to go up to Fort Patrick Henry. That's Norfolk, okay, Norfolk, Virginia, Tidewater. That's the, a huge seaport, but it's a Navy base on the East Coast. So these guys are going to get on ship, uh, and then they're going to head uh, across the pond. They don't know where they're going yet. They don't know to where they're going to get to till they get on the, out to sea. And then, the, then they're told where they're going. And they're going to go to work for this guy. Mark Clark is now in charge of, uh, when they leave, he's in charge of Fifth Army. And they're going to report to him. Now, back in 1940, when Clark was a lieutenant colonel, um, he was in favor of the mountain troops. And his boss was General McNear, and his General McNear didn't want the mountain troop, but he did. He was an advocate for it. So now, he, after they get trained up and everything, he kind of thought that these guys were a little bit too elite, that he, so they were turning it down. So what General Marshall did, he asked Eisenhower and he asked MacArthur, do you want these, these mountain troops? They both said no. And uh, Beetle Smith was the chief of staff for MacArthur, and he said, and all those mules? Hell no. So, so, Mark, so Mark Clark has offered the mountain troops, and he says, I'll take anybody I can get. Because Mark Clark has just lost six divisions to go to be in uh, uh, Operation Dragoon, Anvil, which was the op it was follow on after D Day. It was the attack in southern France. To go. So he really needs them. So he's going to get them. The 86 gets out there to Naples. This is what Naples looked like. It was destroyed by both sides. Um, and who do they see when they're getting off the boat? They're walking down the gangway. And who's this gorgeous gal down at the bottom handing out cigarettes and donuts? It's the same girl that went around the country showing ski movies, getting their applications. And there she is. Yeah, yeah, she was there before they were. And she was there after they left. She, she was there a whole year from October 44 to October 45. That wonderful gal. So uh, there's Debbie again. So what are you guys going to do? All right, here you go, boys. Now this and ladies, the good guys are in the blue, the bad guys are in the red. They're going to get to Naples. Naples is way down here. So now they got to get on, the, on a boat, and they have to get up there to, to Pisa. The port for Pisa is called Langhorn. Uh, it's called Livorno. They called it Leghorn. So, so it's, it's, it's 
in history and in, in all the writing, they, they use both names interchangeably. I'm not exactly positive about that. But they get here and they're going to bivouac outside of Pisa. And they're going to go in and they're going to relieve Task Force 45. Task Force 45 was a group of anti-aircraft gunners. And we don't need anti-aircraft anymore because we've drove in, driven the Luftwaffe from the skies. So that they're going to go in there. The 92nd Division is the black division. These are black soldiers commanded by white officers. The British, uh, sorry, the Belgian Expeditionary Force. And these three, these three units here are all under 4th Corps, which is General Crittenberger. The rest of the, uh, the, the rest of these guys, this is the 6th South African Armored and then three U.S. divisions, the 88th, the 34th, and the 85th Division. And this is under General Keyes. So this is the Gustav line that you were asking about, okay? The, the Gustav line has to be held here because the objective is going to be the Po Valley, which is way up north here. And so what these guys are going to have to do, what both of these corps are going to be attempting to do, is to push the Germans out of Italy. So when, when Hayes gets there, Truscott gets him, and Truscott says, I'm going to give you a tough job, but I'm going to give you, I want you to figure it out, for, so you're going to get a week or two to figure out what you're going to do. So he says, so Hayes tells him, all right, let me know what it is. He says, well, this is the mountain range. This is the mountain range where you're going to be, well, where, where, where the Germans are, and we have, they, have to be evacu they have to be eradicated. They have to be destroyed and, and moved. So he says, all right, I, I, I got an idea how I'm going to do this. Now, the, the, the key terrain feature is this mountain range here. And it goes back for seven miles. The first mountain is Mount Belvedere. Then there's Mount Gogolesco on the side. Then there's a series of hills. Mount Terciata is over here and some other ones. Mount Delespe is way down here. So we're going to have to take this whole thing because this overlooks the roads. There's two main roads that go to Bologna, and it goes north. And in order for us to get our armor up through Italy, we're going to have to take this. So Hayes, being an artilleryman, he says, all right, well, in order to take this mountain, and this mountain was, been, was taken three times in 1944. The Germans had taken it back every time. So he said, I got to... If I attack it this way, straight up, the artillery, which is back here, is going to land on me here, and they'll have me flank and rear fires on my troops. So we've got to take Reaver Ridge first. So in order to take Reaver Ridge first, I have to find the routes up, up Mount Reaver Ridge. So at first, they come up with five routes, and then they decide that they're going to narrow it down to four routes. And so the night of the 18th of February of 1945, the 1st Battalion of the 86th Mountain Infantry takes, they, they climb River Ridge at night, and then they take this hill in a series of fights. The, German, the Germans counterattack for about a week, and then the fight goes on, but, but they actually take it that first night. And then that was the supporting attack. The main attack is here on Mount Belvedere. So you're going to use, you've got, you've got nine battalions in the division. You're going to use all of them. Now, some of them are going to be in reserve at first, but then they're going to be put to, 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 to use later. The 85th has the toughest job. The 85th Regiment is going to go 3rd Battalion, 1st Battalion, 2nd Battalion. Now, we talked about Hugh Evans. Hugh Evans was in 1st Battalion. He attacked Mount Gorgulescu. This is where Hugh Evans won his Silver Star. Was on, was on Mount Gorgolesco, okay? Um, then there's two battalions from the 87th. They're going to go on the far side on the, uh, to, uh, to Rocco Carina. And then the rest of the division is going to, and 386 is going to come this way. Now, it's all the night of the 18th of February, we're going to take River Ridge. Then the night of the 19th, we're going to, take, we're going to attack Mount Belvedere, okay? So that's, that's the scheme of maneuver. That's how, that's how it's going to go down. Um, and who's going to do it? It's going to be these guys. It's, it's going to be these guys. I got my three letters. You know, I sent in my application. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm one of these guys. I'm, I'm going to do this. Look at these guys. 
He's a, look at how young and beautiful they were. I mean, that's, they're young and beautiful. We all look like that at one time. <laughs> yeah. So, and this guy up here with his tongue sticking out, I'll show you him again in a minute. Um, uh, but that's, that's that. Um, so here's Reaver Ridge. Here's, here's a picture of Reaver Ridge and what that looked like. Um, pretty, pretty tough. Uh, four roots that are going to be used to go up that. Then the night of the 19th, they, they, uh, they, they start the, the, attack, the attack on uh, Mount Belvedere. So that's what Mount Belvedere looks like at the top then. Now it's full of trees. So this was 75 years ago, so it looks nothing like this now. Um, and as, you, as they work their way down that ridge line from Mount Belvedere, Mount Gorgolescu, you can, you, the, the enemy has a vote, okay, how fast you can go, okay? Because you're gonna run out of bullets, you're gonna run out of grenades, you're gonna run out of water, you're gonna run out of chow, so you're gonna have to stop at some point, right? So they have to, phase one, they take them out Belvedere, they take them out Gorgolescu, you've got to keep on going. So the, the second phase begins on March the 3rd. And so on March the 3rd of 45 is when the second phase begins, and that's when, that's when Pete Seibert gets wounded badly, that's when Togra Torkel gets killed, is, is on March the 3rd. Um, but then Italy, once you go, this is what it looks like. This is what, that's about the size of the roads, those, those cart paths, those, uh, those narrow dirt cart paths. And then when you could get to a, a better road, then your vehicles could come up behind you. These are tank destroyers coming up behind these guys. And you'll notice that these guys aren't wearing packs. Their packs are being on vehicles, and their vehicles are coming up behind them. So now the idea is to get go north, cross the Po River, and get up here. Now, they've got to stop the Germans before they get to the Brenner Pass so they can uh, hold them um, and, and where they're at, and they want to defeat them while they're still in Italy. But there's a lot of guys killed. And so the, the, the next battle actually begins on the 14th of April, and the 14th of April was the bloodiest day in the history of the 10th. And you might remember this young guy. He gets, he gets badly wounded uh, then on the 14th of April. Uh, and he spends uh, three years in the hospital. He, he loses the use of his right arm. Uh, and he never has a, the use of his right arm again. Um, one Medal of Honor recipient uh, was John McGrath. Uh, for his, he was killed on Hill 909 on the 15th of April. Um, many, many guys were killed that day. He, John McGrath and his company commander were killed about the same time. Um, uh, his company commander's name was Otis Halverson. Um, I know his son, uh, Otis's son, uh, but John, uh, but this is the only guy that got the Medal of Honor in, the, in all of the fighting. So when they get up to the Po River, um, they've got to get across the Po River. Um, so Hayes, what Hayes does is he brings up the ducks and the Ducks were supposed to go to the 85th Division, which was an adjacent division, which was farther uh, north than them. And, but he has two, a warrant officer and an enlisted man, they go out and they convince the guy that's carrying the, the, the boats to come over with them. And so Hayes starts getting across the river. Then he gets the Ducks up there. Um, and then after he does, uh, he goes and and the Germans are running as fast as they can. The Americans in the 10th is chasing them as fast as they can. And they're on their way to Lake Garda. So the Lake Garda is where one of the roads goes. He has a chance. He has a chance. So then we get to uh, Lake Garda, Mussolini's castle. They have to, this is where Mussolini is. And he, they take his castle um, and they keep going. Uh, the assistant division commander is wounded, and so he's replaced by Colonel Darby. Uh, this is the guy that was the founder of the, of the, uh, of the Rangers. Um, 
then on the 2nd of uh, May is when the Germans surrender in Italy. And so once they're, they've surrendered, then General Hayes has to go across the lake and he has to get the German commander, who's General von Singer. This guy was really smart, um, really a good officer. And he surrenders and he has to go. And after they surrender, uh, the, all of the, the people come out of the villages and stuff like that, and everybody's happy. This is Castel Diano. Uh, this is near Mount del Espay. And they start to bring out the, uh, the, the Italians bring out the wine. And then, and they, then they start to say, this is, this is what, uh, th we've been hiding this from the Germans all this time. And so we don't want them to have it, but you guys can have it. So now, Every soldier, General Hayes says, every, uh, every one of my soldiers gets a bottle of champagne and every officer gets a bottle. I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it. And this, this beautiful young guy is the dad of that gentleman right back there. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Use my inspiration to become a military destroyer. <laughs> so that, that's Flint's dad. Uh, so... Um, I, was, I, I didn't give you enough credit because I got a lot of these slides from him. And he was the, he was the guy that was an inspiration to me to start doing this. So, and so after Lake Garda, these guys I had to go down to the Getty Airport. And they were at the Getty Airport that had to guard prisoners for a little while. But then after that, um, that got, their, their, their needs were greater. So they, they had to be sent over to the Yugoslav border. So they leave from the Getty Airport and they drive across. This is about 300 miles. And they have to get into all of these towns over here on the border so that they uh, um, can keep Tito and the communists from encroaching into Italy. Mm -hmm. So they do that and they, they're in a series of towns there. Oh, sorry. And then, and then, all of these little towns, there's like at least a company, sometimes a battalion or is, is, in, is here in these towns. And you see Mount Mangiart? So these guys, they're, they're, there was never a firefight with the Yugoslavs, okay? There was just posturing and moving up and down and things like that. So they decided then that we needed to get back to what we're really good at. So we decided to have the, the, a ski race. So they set up the, Mount Man the, the 10th Mountain Invitational Ski Race on Mount Mangiart. And who do you think wins it? The greatest skier in the world, Walter Prager. <laughs> well, Friedel Pfeiffer was wounded, so he wasn't there. So, so anyway, they have the ski race. They set up a climbing school. They set up a climbing school because they're right next to Austria there. And they, they, go, they could go over into Austria to do climbing. Um, they did the climbing. And this guy here, Woodward, um, Bob Woodward, he gets his battalion finally. And this guy was the ski coach at Washington, at the University of Washington. He was at the 10th from the very, very beginning. This guy was still ski racing in his 80s. Um, I think he lived to be 100 uh, or so, but, I, but Bob Woodward was really quite a soldier. So the 10th goes home uh, in July. Uh, of 45, they get on the boats, they go home, they get back to, back to New York. There was about 1,000 guys killed from the 10th during the war, about 4,000 wounded. Here's some of the alumni from the 10th. Frank Sargent went on to be the uh, uh, governor of Massachusetts, and Bob Dole ran for president in 96. David Brower was a Sierra Club. Uh, he ran the Sierra Club for 25 years. Ben Duke. Well, it was here. In, he lived in Boulder. He, 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 was the, he was the president of Gates Rubber uh, down on Broadway. Merrill Hastings was the uh, editor of Ski Magazine. Bill Bowerman was the guy, co-founder of Nike. Um, and he was a, a track coach back there at uh, Oregon. Over 62 different ski areas were started by guys from the 10th, um, from veteran involvement. These are some of the ones here in Colorado where these guys were all involved with. Uh, Fritz Benedict was the architect of the hut system. Um, here's, what, here's Camp Hale today. There, there's nothing, hardly anything left there. 
There's, these were the, the supply sheds were. Um, that's the back of the rifle range. It's, it's still there, 100 targets down that line. Uh, and it's, it, it's still there. It, you can, it looks just like that if you go there today. This is the, the, the remains of the field house. And this is where they used to have their dances and they had promotions and they have different, or, different meetings there in the field house. Um, this is my old place. This is the Mountain Warfare Training Center. This is the only place where we still have mulesles. We, we, we got 30 mules and three horses and a donkey <laughs> that are there. And we still train people from uh, the Army, from the Navy, from the SEALs. We train foreign forces on mule packing and how do you, how do, you do mules. And here you go, lady. This is your, the 10th Mountain. This is the Tennessee Pass. It's the War Memorial. This is what happens on Memorial Day up, at, uh, up there at the Camp Hale, well, well at, at Tennessee Pass. And so it's, you can see how crowded it is every year up there. This was taken in 2014. Um, and the guy that had his tongue sticking out in that photo is him. That's Hugh Evans. Uh, and then he's gone, he's gone, he's gone, he's gone, he's gone. And this is Dick. This is the guy in the blue jacket uh, that has, is in a, a, the Alzheimer's uh, hospital in Loveland. And He's gone. Uh, Trip is still with us, and, and Bob Dunlop is still with us. I think Crosby Perry Smith is still with us. This is this was uh, Treat Sandy Treat, the guy in the green shirt. Uh, he's gone. There's Dick, and there's uh, Neil Yorker, and he's gone. Um, so they're going fast. Uh, this is the guy that took Mussolini's castle. Um, he's gone, and there. And there's Minnie Dole, the founding father, the guiding spirit. We wouldn't have a 10th Mountain Division without him. Um, and here's the, the, stat, the marker with the names. Um, all of, uh, every name on here, these are the names of the guys who were killed. Uh, and this is where they were and what they did. And uh, Semper Avanti, always forward. So I should have asked you if you had any questions you could ask a question during the brief, but yes, sir. Uh, Hugh Evans won the Silver Star. Yeah. I heard that he it started when his commanding officer died in his arms on Gorgolesco. No. And he went on to okay, is that wrong? Yeah, his his commanding officer was a guy named uh, Page Smith. Page Smith had both of his legs broken um, it, on the fifteenth. Of April, but that's that's not what happened. I mean, not, then his that guy was replaced, and I don't know who re replaced him. If I uh, I could find out, but uh, but his but he, he didn't die in his arms. But he went on to uh, take out some German machine guns. Right? Oh yeah, that's how he got the that. Yeah, that's how he got the Silver Star. It was very very brave. I mean, it was incredibly brave. In fact, we had Hugh here as a coffee and conversation speaker. If you're ever interested to uh, hear his talk, you can go on to our website, link into our kind of our index of uh, coffee and conversation speakers, and you can find him. It was a good four or five years ago. Now, yeah. if, like, yeah. oh, go ahead, sir. At, uh, several years ago, we would have that special room, and we had the Mountain Division display all around that room upstairs. Uh -huh. And I was on duty a number of times, and people would come in and bring their father, uncle, somebody. Yeah. And say, I lived right there. That's that's where my barracks was. That, and then yeah. just start pointing at all the pic pictures. Yeah. Of, uh, right. Upstairs that we had. Yeah. I, I mean, since most of the vets are gone now, it's it's the descendants who come and have comments and things like that. And then I have, I have. 300 photographs of them, you know, different as young men as when they were during the war, during the war years. Um, these are my books. I, I wrote or I co-wrote both of these. If you would like one, they're $15 a piece or two for 25. If you'd like to, to hear the story, I've tried to keep it everything in it's true. Uh, the hero in this book is a composite of four different guys. But uh, we made that hero 
so that he was a hero, but it's the true stories of his story is the four, uh, four guys put together into one. Yes, sir? So would you characterize these books as historical fiction? Yes, they're, they're, they're okay, they're novels. All novels are fiction, okay? So I've tried to keep this as historically accurate. I mean, I didn't footnote it or anything like that to say where it came from, but, but I'm telling you everything I put but in there. Sim similar to the idea of the Killer Angels right. or... Yeah, I think... Or yeah, K Killer Angels is a little bit more uh, historic, do a, a historic document than these are. I don't think Killer Angels had a... A definite hero. Yes, sir. Um, I know uh, the Tenth Mount yeah. Division is, is headquartered up in Fort Drum, New York, and that's yeah. considered to be chillier than Florida and things of that sort. But is the mission of the Tenth Mount Division drastically different than what it was in World War II? Um, yeah. Well. Well. Yes and no. Um, the 10th Light Division in Fort Drum is not a division like this. The 10th Light Division of Fort Drum has helicopters. Um, these guys never had a helicopter or an airplane or of any kind. Okay, these guys were set up with three regiments. They have brigades, and a, a brigade at Fort Drum is a task organized unit to perform specific ma uh, tasks. And so they are uh, different than these, but this is their heritage. Okay. okay, these so this is where they really came from. But they also have you know operated in almost similar terrain. If you get sent to <laughs> Afghanistan, uh, you're basically distributed out into a lot of separate little combat posts, which are all isolated up in the hills. Yeah, um, I, I used to work in Alaska. And I saw a YouTube clip of, I think it was a brigade of the 25th, mm -hmm. jumping, jumping uh, airborne That's onto the heart. Mm -hmm. And I've been in minus 40 degree weather, and it just blows my mind. You can get that at Fort Drum, because I got it there. Yeah, it, it's just. That's the coldest night I ever spent in a tent, was at Fort Drum. And it was 40 <laughs> below. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> well, my, my dad was in the 10th Mountain, caught at Mount Belvedere. And he, I remember him telling me when they were training that they took him up to Mount Evans mm -hmm. and in the winter, you know, in, in a tent up there. And, and there were guys that died in the training. You shouldn't make it through that. Um, I would question your dad's memory about that. There, there's a, the, only, the only, the research that I've done, and I've tried to find out how many guys died at Camp Hale. And the only ones that I can find is that there was an exercise and they were shooting mortars. And so the unit had to, be, had to move the mortars. And so when the mortars went up and down, they had a short round and it landed and two guys were killed. I mean, that's the only times that I, but there were plenty of guys that got frostbit and they had to come down, they had to go back to the, to the, uh, to the uh, hospital. Um, some guys had to be transferred out um, and there was guys that had to be transferred out because of the Pando hack. But as far as guys killed at Camp Hale, I can't, I can't say that that's the only two that I could find. Do you, Flint? Uh, well, there was a, uh, an accident, it was an aviation accident, and there were somewhere between 12 and 20, I don't have an exact number, uh, 10th Mountain soldiers who were at Camp Hale who died in a, a plane crash somewhere in the mountains, but. Mm. The details on that are very hazy. I, I haven't been able to do a lot of research yeah. into that. Yeah, yeah. Well, Tom, thank you so much. Hey, for this this gent has. I want to know where that plaque is located, where all the casualties are listed. That, that here? No, it's a Tennessee Pass. Tennessee pass. It's a. 
it's it's a it's a it's it's a piece of granite it's about that thick and it's about 15 feet tall. And, you can do that at the top of Tennessee Pass. Yeah, you go there and then and if you take the road and go to the right, you'll go to Ski Cooper. That's where the ski area was. Or you go at Minter. Oh, you can come all the way around. Yeah, you can do that way too. Well, anyway, let's, uh, Tom, we'd like to present you one of our challenge coins, and thank, thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. I cherish this. Thank now, you. I'm sure our author would be glad to sign one of these books for you. Yeah. So if you'd like one, please come on up. Also, not to take away from Tom's uh, literary uh, results here, is we have a lot of books that need a new home from our library. Uh, we have them on a cart out there that I'll bring into here and also one down by the refreshment place. And they cover everything from a historical stuff like Rick Atkinson's series on World War II, which is superb, uh, to novels and stuff like that. So we really do need a new home. So take one or two home with you today. Yes, ma'am. I have this question, and I was asking him, when did they tear everything down? I mean, my husband and I would walk, hike, and hike through all that area, and you know, all the remnants, and it's so historic. Uh, yeah. And I know that it would just kind of be falling apart by now, but it's you know, a, why did they six, tear it down? Well, no, I mean, you, you, it's bureaucracy. Okay, is the real answer. I mean, but what what the what the army decided was that they weren't going to train men to be skiers anymore. So they actually started tearing down Camp Hale when these guys went to Camp Swift. They they hadn't even left for Italy yet when they started tearing it down. Now the State Department came back and they used it as an area because they were training Tibetan soldiers to fight in China. Um, but they finished tearing it down completely in 63. There's a camping area in that area, too. Yeah, there, there is, and there's, there's trails. and There's a... There's a... Oh, yeah, pay camp. Yeah. Very, very primitive. There's an outfit called Novo Guides, and they will rent you a snowmobile, or they'll rent, rent you an, an all-terrain vehicle, and you can go run around there. And, well, it's beautiful just to hike around. Drive in and oh yeah, it is. It's a great place. Aren't there ski huts all up through? There? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There is. Yeah, the 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 jackal hut is right at the very top. If you go to the rifle range, there's a road that goes up. You take that up and you get the jackal hut. And if you on the other side of the road, uh, down it'll say uh, Slide Mountain. You can go back there, and that's where the Tenth Mountain hut is. My, uh, my brother-in-law taught at uh, Leadville Junior High for years. And my, uh, I have two nephews and a niece that grew up there and learned to ski on Cooper Hill. Sure, man, thousands did. Ski patrol at Vail for 25 years. Yeah, thousands did. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, could we hold down the discussion, please? My dad worked at Climax Mine for about 35 years. And I grew up in Leadville and Kokomo and Climax. And when I was a kid in Kokomo, the 10th yeah. Mountain used to come over the hill and do maneuvers around Kokomo all the time. Two stories I remember about that. One time they brought a bulldozer in and they made a big berm and they were going to keep all the mules in there overnight. <laughs> One of the mules decided, I'm not staying here. He went over the berm. We got up to go to school the next morning, and there were mules all over Kokomo. Oh, I'm sure, yeah. <laughs> well, that. And, and another story, because the snow situation was so bad in Kokomo, we had a porch and a, a clothesline that went up to like a utility pole, and my mom would run her clothes up and down. We got up one morning, and there were some guys in our backyard and they were setting up a machine gun behind this snow berm. Yeah. 
And my mom went out there and told him, she says, you know, guys, you may not want to be messing around that. That berm you're hiding behind, that's our propane tank. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's right. Here, I'll tell you another mule story. It's a true story. When they went down to Camp Swift, they took a bunch of the mules and they put them in train cars. And they sent them down to Camp Swift. And then these mules had been in these train cars for about three days. So when they went to, to, to get the mules out, they escaped. And then there was hundred, hundreds of mules running around Travis County, Texas for like a month. And uh, Jim liked that cowboy. He said, we were chasing mules for a month trying to get, catch the, all these mules down in Texas. I know what, the, instead of having KP, I know what the troops did when they got in a little bit of trouble. What? Got a big, big scoop. For them. Yeah. Well, you had to do it whether you, you had to do that whether you got in trouble or not. Yeah, yeah. somebody had to. Yeah. Good. Well, thank you very much. And please stick around and visit. We also have a small exhibit in the war.